Welcome to Reporter's Notebook, where we talk to the Washington Examiner's top journalists about the stories breaking on their beats. I'm Jim Antle. I'm joined today by defense reporter Mike Brest. Mike, the National Defense Authorization Act has cleared another congressional hurdle. It keeps getting bigger and bigger, at least in terms of the top line numbers. Where do we stand right now? So as of right now, uh, the NDAA, which is what funds the Department of Defense every year, uh, has passed through both the Senate Armed Services Committee and the House Armed Services Committee. They have both uh, debated it, added amendments, voted on amendments, and then ultimately passed this in committee. And so the next step is they will individually vote on them uh, in their respective chambers. They'll come together for uh, sort of a meeting of the bills. Uh, and then they will come forward with a, a singular unified bill. Now, to take a step backwards, uh, President Biden uh, requested essentially slightly over $800 billion at the top line. Right. Now that's uh, almost all of it is for the Department of Defense with uh, a roughly $30 billion for the Department of Energy included. Mm -hmm. uh, the Senate uh, and Senate Republicans on the committee in particular have been a lot more outspoken saying it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. Now, we should note that this is the largest defense budget ever put forward if right. a word we passed. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, in hearing after hearing on the Hill, we've heard from defense leaders uh, that the bill was passed uh, when inflation was a lot lower than it is right now. Right. And so when they baked in inflation into these price lines, uh, it was much less than it is right now. And mm -hmm. so DOD is still confident that despite the growth in inflation, uh, the NDAA as structured would still be plenty. Mm -hmm. That being said, the Senate voted to increase the defense budget by roughly $45 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the House, even against the committee chairman uh, Adam Smith's recommendation, voted to increase their budget by $37 billion. Right. So there's a little bit of a difference between the two of them, mm -hmm. uh, but both members, uh, or both House, both, both chambers, chambers, thank mm -hmm. you. Both chambers have passed this uh, with a significant bump to an already larger than before defense budget. And when these bills come before Congress, they're generally considered must pass bills, always get passed every year. Uh, you know, there'll be some fights over different procedural things, different provisions in the bills. But that's been the general trend as the White House asks for a certain amount of money. Congressional Democrats put more money in it, and Congressional Republicans in the NDAA, they tend to think there should be more money still. Absolutely, and so there was, there was a lot of debate uh, in these committees about various amendments, uh, what programs should be ceased, what programs should continue, what technology should we invest in, and so there were a number of debates, uh, amendments raised by both sides. There were some that were bipartisan in support, some that uh, were, were very partisan and passed and didn't pass respectively. Uh, but it would be interesting to see just what these bills look like moving forward. So we've had some controversy over Americans in Ukraine. We've, we've seen uh, some casualties. We've also heard some saber rattling from Russia. What is sort of the update about that? So the State Department confirmed earlier this week that the a second American has died in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, and in addition to those two Americans who've lost their lives, uh, it also came out this week that three Americans are being held by R Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and those three Americans uh, are most likely dual citizens uh, who are living in Ukraine and decided to take up arms on the Ukrainian side. Because there have been a number of foreign fighters who've gone to Ukraine, some of them ethnic ethnically, but other, a variety of other types of people have come on and tried to fight the Russians on Ukraine's side. Absolutely. Right. A number of Ukrainian officials at the start of the war reached out and pleaded for both Ukrainians abroad and anyone who was willing to fight to come to Ukraine to fight. And now there are obviously specific uh, requirements to be able to join the Ukrainian military. Right. Uh, but for Americans who are also living and residing in Ukraine, uh, a lot of them fit the requirements for uh, the male entry into the, into the military. Mm -hmm. That being said, we heard earlier this week uh, from the Kremlin that these Americans uh, would, not be con would not be given the rights that are afforded to them under the Geneva con Convention. Mm -hmm. And so we heard that there's a possibility that these Americans could be given a death penalty, a uh, sentence could be executed, uh, and all of this is coming uh, as Russia is trying to hold thousands of these similar types of hearings, uh, which the Western world has really come out strongly and condemned uh, and accused them of running sham uh, hearings and sham trials uh, to mirror what the Ukrainians are doing as they try and hold Russians as responsible for war crimes. 
So the Russians have argued that these are not bona fide members of the Ukrainian military, so they're therefore not afforded normal POW protections. But the U.S. government, even though they've discouraged Americans from going to Ukraine to fight, uh, was outraged by that position. Absolutely. Both the State Department, uh, the National Security Council, the White House, top down, everyone in the Biden administration really came out the day after uh, the Kremlin made these comments and really put their foot down and said this is not an acceptable or tenable situation. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't really know what would happen uh, as this plays out moving forward, but right. at the same time, it is interesting to see how uh, this one aspect of the war could really potentially draw the U.S. a little bit closer than they'd like to the flame. So there was a report that came out that detailed uh, some aspects of Russia's progress or lack thereof in the war in Ukraine and talked about some of the resources that have been committed. What are some of the takeaways? So <clears throat> as we know, we're now almost completing the fourth month of the war and for right. a significant period of that time all of the fighting has been really concentrated in the Donbass region. Mm -hmm. Now that is a, a major setback from what President Putin really wanted to see at the start of the war. Mm -hmm. To the Kremlin they were expecting to be able to overthrow the government and instill a puppet regime within a matter of days. And so for it to be almost four months down and the fighting concentrated to the east where they've been fighting for almost eight years now uh, has really been somewhat of a of a big letdown, a disappointment. And so it was reported earlier this week by the Institute for the Study of War uh, that Russia had replaced one of its top generals, uh, and there are indications that more could, could have been replaced with, along with him. Mm -hmm. And now this, again, isn't the first time we've even seen uh, President Putin make this step as to reshuffle his military leadership, uh, but to do it again suggests even further how f how much they've underperformed thus far. So these are sort of repercussions for how poorly the war has gone from the Russian point of view thus far. That's what it, that's what it would seem like. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mike. You can read Mike and the rest of our national security team's coverage at WashingtonExaminer.com.